Jesus. The bride in the sunshine, golden and red and orange light. Just amazing. And Louis. Yeah, it's glowing. Okay. Can I turn this on, Justin, without it blowing up? Yeah, turn it on. Turn it on. This one? Da 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 da. Everybody's very meditative. It's wonderful. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Pradna Paramita Hridaya. In Tibetan, Chomden Dema Shara Parchin Yingpo. In English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Rajagurha, together with the great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed the venerable Sharadati Putra thus, Shariputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. Voidness is not other than matter. Neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, thus all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness there are no matter, no sensation, no conception. Function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance and so on up to no old age and death, and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shariputra, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, he lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. Her spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, she ultimately succeeds in nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood and unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth. The Transcendent Wisdom Mantra, as follows, Tadyata. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha. 
Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Swaha. Shariputra, thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it. And even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the blessed Lord had spoken thus, the venerable Sharadati Buddha, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies rejoiced and all applauded what the Buddha said. <laughs> Uh, that's really fun. There's a few things to say, maybe in comment. And um, which is that Avalokiteshvara, or first of all, that uh, the sutra itself is called Blessed Lady Buddha, that is Bhagavati. And um, this is because the transcendent wisdom. Pradnya Paramita is said to be the mother of all Buddhas because all Buddhas must go through her to be present, to become Buddhas, and to be present, to be born as Buddhas, become present in the world. And in general, wisdom is identified with the female, in fact, actually. And Bhagavati, which is like Bhagavan, like, like our dear old Bhagavan Das, <laughs> he lives across the road from me nowadays, uh, temp temporarily, he's renting there. Anyway, this Bhagavan, which comes to be the name of God in, in Hinduism, um, at this time, was the first real use of it is this. And it means a lucky one. Bhaga means a share, a portion, a fortune. And Bhaga means, it can also mean a vagina, actually, if you want to know how everything at all levels is interconnected in Sanskrit. So Bhagavati or Bhagavan. So that's the first one. The second one thing I wanted to just mention is that as the name Avalokita Ishvara. Ishvara is, means God, actually, capital G-O-D. And the um, Brahminical Hindus later, the Vedist Brahmins did not think of Ishvara as world creator. They didn't really have a creator. Uh, they, they had uh, a panoply of gods like the Olympian gods and no one creator sort of thing, although toward the latter part of Vedis, Vedism, bef before Buddhism and uh, Jainism arose in India, uh, in the latter part of Vedism, they began to think of Brahma as a creator. And the Brahma, Brahma really was originally meant the language it meant the sound of the ritual. So they, their offering ritual to the Olympian gods became the creator for those Vedist Brahmins. And then later when you began to have Hinduism after Buddhism and Jainism had changed the nature of Indian religion, uh, and Hinduism being a combination of them with Vedism, um, they then elevated Brahma to a creator role and then Different Indians, some took Shiva rather than Brahma, and some took Vishnu rather than Brahma. And but they were different forms. They were monotheistic forms. They were not polytheistic. They were monotheistic, but they just had different names of the one God and the different visions of them in different groups. And, um, and then the create, whichever one was called the creator was called Maha Ishvara, the great God. And then the Buddhists came along with the idea of the divine power or the ultimate power of the universe not being, you know, fearsome power, creative power and punishing power, but with the idea that the greater power was compassion. And uh, so they took the symbol of the old king of the gods in Vedism, Indra, which was something called a Vajra, and which was um, which could mean diamond, but it would mean in that early period it meant a thunderbolt. So it was the idea of the supreme power of the of the head god Indra. And the Buddhists changed that around where Vajra came to mean compassion, 
and love as the strong power of the universe. And, in, and at the same time around as they were bringing that forward, they had this um, idea of this great bodhisattva who was sort of a Buddha bodhisattva, like already a pretty perfected bodhisattva, uh, Avalokiteshvara. And his name Avalokita Ishvara is a kind of critique of the idea of Maha Ishvara. Because Avalokita means who looks down with loving concern. So the god who looks with loving concern became the model of the divine rather than the god who is great you know, and powerful and dominating and fearsome, actually. And um, so this concept of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara is a very powerful one in India. And um, although the Indians have lost track of it because Buddhism was destroyed by the Islamic invasion of India in the around 1100, uh, from 800 to 1100 of the Common Era. And, um, but a lot of the sweetness in classical Indian culture comes from that, the, the bhakti idea, because you know, the old Vedic gods were not loving type gods. They didn't love you. They were powerful, and you had to placate them through the Brahminical ritual. And um, so that's why the ritual became so important, actually. Anyway, that's the second point. The third point is I love the fact that the Shariputra, who is known as the foremost of the wise in the Theravada tradition, the monastic Buddhist, or I call it individualist Buddhist tradition, of those seeking their own freedom and liberation from suffering and enlightenment. And he asks uh, Avalokiteshvara, how does a noble son practice or learn and practice the transcendent wisdom. And then Avalokiteshvara answers, any noble son or noble daughter. Because <laughs> the dualism of the early, both Sankhya, both the early Hindu philosophers and the Buddhist philosophers of the Theravada and Mahasankhika schools, the 18 different uh, monastic Buddhist schools, uh, they, they were mainly male Brahmins. And they were dualists, actually. And they, wanted to, they couldn't think of the idea of this world as it is, being nirvana. They couldn't deal with that. The world itself being nirvana, and one's ignorance preventing one from understanding the world itself as being nirvana. They had to think of nirvana as something beyond the world, and so that you had to get out of the world. And here, this is being rejected, all of this. And the fourth thing, that's three things, and the fourth thing is this thing, no eye, no ear, no nose. What is this all about? This is a very good uh, meditation of the type that Dale was teaching last night, and I understand also very, very, very skillfully and effectively this morning, about where you sort of discard your boundary type of thing. But, and you know, you get over your fear of death by not holding back from being one with the universe. So you can't die once you're one with the whole universe. You know, there's nothing to die into. You are the whole thing, so to speak, right? So, but, you, but, but the Buddhist, um, Buddhists were scientists. Buddha was a scientist, not just some asking somebody to believe him on something. He was asking people to look at reality. And if they did, they would find it. Now, this relates to what I call the nose challenge. Now, I want you all to meditate on your own nose, which this sutra here says, Avalokiteshvara, inspired by the Buddha's illumination of the profound samadhi, teaching samadhi, says, no nose. Okay. Now, meditate about your nose. What do you mean, no nose? <laughs> I have a nose, I think. I'm into my nose. I always jokingly say that nose is our lifelong hood ornament. And we're all cruising along with the nose there. And uh, if you have a little, tight, little nice petite nose, then maybe you have to go cross-eyed to find it. But if you have a big one like me, you can easily see it. But what does it mean that no nose? What does that mean? OK. Now, this is your meditation. It is a discursive, analytic meditation, not just a quieting meditation. And what is it? OK. Now, right now, 
Where is your nose? Try to point out your nose in your mind. I mean, you can also take your finger if you like. You point out your nose. Now, if in fact you put your fingertip on your nose, then is that your nose that you're touching? Could you lose that patch of skin in an accident or through plastic surgery or for whatever reason? If you could do that, would you still have a nose with a, with a, uh, you know, a uh, scar there or a, a hole there or a different shape of skin or a piece of plastic there? Would it still be your nose? I think you're, if you meditate on that, you will decide, yes, it, is, it would be my nose without what I'm now touching. So in fact, what I'm now touching is a, something that is not actually my nose. Maybe I could say part of my nose, but for me to say part of my nose, I have to meaningfully know what the nose is. Okay? So then, move your finger over to where the nose curves onto the cheek bone, the skin. If you press down, you hit a cheekbone. You don't hit a nose cartilage when you move it over there. Now, where does this, what does it stop being the nose and start being the cheek when you do that? If you go down the, off the tip of your nose, where does it stop being the nose here and become the upper lip? If you go upward, when does it become the brow and is no longer the nose? Or they go to the other side, nose and cheek. What is the boundary? Can you actually put your finger on that boundary? I don't think so. Actually, is there a boundary? I don't know. If you went to a plastic surgeon, and apparently I had not been, unfortunately, probably, but I haven't been, but I understand they will show you kind of a graph of your face with the cross-hatched lines, you know, like geometric lines. And then they will make it by computer. They will give it different shapes so you can pick the new nose that you want, right? By shaping, reshaping the nose, taking some pieces off, putting some pieces on, right? And then, but then the line where the last line which they put, which defines the nose, of course, is arbitrary. And also, it's not there because the line has no width. Uh, I hope you're meditating along with me. Then, on top of that, you touch the nose on a point, so, supposedly, but actually some part of the skin of the fingertip touches some part of the skin of the nose. That how much depends on how much you press and which, what angle of the nose you put it on. And actually, there's no point involved. So actually, even in a computer model of your nose, every point in that model, not one of them is your nose. It's not one of those points is on your nose. And actually, the point to be a point has no size. So in fact, it's totally not on there. Right? But the little dots even, no one of the dots. So therefore, your nose is something that is made up of an infinite number of pieces of things that are not your nose. Does everyone get that? So actually, if you seek to pinpoint your real nose, you will not find anything to pinpoint. Do you sort of see how that thought experiment could work? If you brought strong concentration onto that, you would experience as a, in, a, in a meditatively sustained thought experiment, you would experience your nose dissolving under analysis. And then you could mentally throw in cells, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, and you know, with whatever popular notions you have about quantum physics, your nose would equally, the parts, the material parts of it would also dissolve under analysis. 
and therefore no nose, the sutra says. So in reciting the sutra, if you have meditated with this kind of vipassana meditating, which means this vi, vi is like bi in English, you know, bicycle, you know, bifurcate. V means to divide. And so V pasana means seeing dividingly, or analytically, that means. And so you would, you, you know, when you read no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, you are reporting the results of all those meditative thought experiments where you have seen your nose, your eye, your ear, your tongue, your body, skin, your mentality dissolve under analysis. Now, you also, of course, you have not realized the nothingness of the nose. So you just still haven't found the nose. You, don't, you never find the nothingness of the nose. You follow me? Think about that. And that's why emptiness or voidness is not nothingness. In a way, you can say you have found the voidness of the nose or the emptiness of the nose, meaning that the conventional habitual nose that, you, that guides your path through life as you go down the road, as I say, like a hood ornament, <laughs> like a car's hood ornament, that nose is empty of the real nose, the sort of one that's absolutely objectively there, that we unfortunately assume is sort of what makes the nose the nose. So it's empty of any sort of essence, intrinsic reality, or intrinsic nose identity, or intrinsic nose referent. It's empty of that, of that kind of a nose. So therefore, another thing you can say is your nose is there when you don't look for it too intensively. When you look for it to sort of really verify it's being there, it disappears. Do you follow me? Why this is a very, very important example. Because no self is just like that. Your self is here. You're sitting here, you're concentrating, you're meditating along with me. We're meditating on this sutra, teaching of this sutra on emptiness. But if we look for that self to say, okay, it's just exactly this. This is the objective reality that I reliably always will find fixed and unchanging and always me and really me then it also will dissolve under analysis just like the nose. And that is the no-self. That is selflessness. When I don't look for it in that way, it is there coordinating, interacting, interrelated with everything, getting better or worse at all times. It's my relational self, my conventional self, my illusory self. and yours too. And therefore, I can never define it into some sort of frozen status. I do not have the security of always being the same no matter what I do or what, ex what conditions I expose myself to or connect myself to. But on the other hand, I cannot say that I cannot become fully open, fully enlightened, fully interconnected. I cannot merge with the luminosity, the clear light transparency of the void, of the emptiness. Thyself can become a Buddha self, but even a Buddha self is a conventional Buddha self. It's a relational Buddha self. As a Buddha self in some sort of absolute aloofness from reality, there's no such thing Buddha's quick to say. 
That's the meaning of the famous Zen, Zen statement. If you meet a Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> they put it in some dramatic way. But they just mean that that Buddha, that thing that you think outside you, that person or that thing, is not really the Buddha. It's, it, it, can, it will dissolve under analysis. Conventionally, it may manifest as a Buddha. It may teach people like a Buddha can. It may awaken the Buddha in the people. But it's not like Buddha's there and not here. Buddha's no more, Buddha's dharmakaya, or body of reality, is just as much in all of us as in, a, in any sort of icon of the Buddha or living icon of the Buddha, living being who's a, who is a Buddha. It's just as much in all of us. Because Buddha, from an enlightened point of view, Buddha becomes a Buddha by feeling he, she, or it is one with every other living being. OK, you're following that? Hopefully. And then I just want to, therefore, double make the point that this being one thing is not what I call the cheap oneness of the mystic. Not that it isn't quite holy and sanctified and sometimes leads some people who are mystics to be very, very nice. But in still, it's a, what I call the cheap one. It's the oneness where everything disappears, including the person who melts into it. And that is presumed to be the great oneness of the ultimate reality. And the one thing about it is nobody is there. The other beings are not there any longer. And you're not there any longer. But it's, you enter it with a vast sense of conviction that it is, it is everything in the universe. It's like the space of the universe. I call that the cheap oneness because it's devoid of all problems. And it's, it's all by itself somehow. It's one alone. Whereas non-dual oneness that Buddha experiences, by definition at least, and I hope it's true, is being one with all of the differentiated things simultaneously, even though illusory, but simultaneously being present. So it's expensive one. It's full of things and people. And then on top of that, the, the, of course, the cost comes because by being full of people, it is not only full of all the other enlightened people, it's full of all the other ignorant people, the egocentric people, the people who think they're separate, who are afraid of death in, in, in Dale's deep formulation. And that's expensive because then your oneness, your wisdom oneness, total openness, is sort of compelled, although they are cautious to say compelled in some helpless way. It's a joyfully compelled. Because it is bliss. It's, it's, it's tied with the experience of it all being blissful. But anyway, that bliss even compels that being to share itself by helping those who think they are separate from the bliss unravel their defenses and their shields and their arbitrary fortifications of themselves against the reality of bliss. against the bliss that, in some sense, you can say they are made of. Now, the reason that in Buddhist meditative psychology, the empty mind meditation is not considered the most important one, or that is to say, shamatha, what they call peaceful, peaceful, staying still, stillness, silence of thought flows. This one is not the ultimate one. The reason of that is precisely that it does not unravel the complex fortification of the closed being. 
the conceptual cage of the, of the ignorant person cannot simply just be eliminated by being ignored. It has to be disassembled carefully and cautiously. And therefore, the vipassana one is the more important one. Although, of course, the vipassana one to reach its goal must deploy the one-pointed concentration that it can be cultivated in the shamatha one. The danger of the shamatha one, the just emptying your mind and disassociating yourself from all thought flow, which can be achieved with the effort, the reason that, uh, the danger of that is that when one floats into a kind of space, one will assume that one has reached the sort of ultimate nature of reality and that this is what reality ultimately is. And even the expression emptiness and the fact that it constantly takes space as its analogy, you know, makes one, you know, can lead one to be disillusioned in that way or rather deceived in that way, where then one goes into one of those spacious states and thinks one is at the absolute, but actually it's just a relational state, according to Buddha's own teaching and experience. For example, from the very earliest time of Buddhism, even when he was allowing people to think on purpose that nirvana was something out of this world, let's say, wasn't pushing non-duality. Even in that beginning dealing with the male chauvinist Brahmins, he carefully said, well, when you go up above the divine planes of the Brahma-bodied gods, the four immeasurable pure states, or Brahma pure abodes, the Brahma Viharas, the four dhyanas, the four contemplative realms of immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, and immeasurable equanimity. If you become so adept and so concentrated that you go even beyond those, the first thing you come to is a realm, but not that you can't use realm anymore. We call it a medium because there's no volume. It's called the medium of infinite space because there's no body, no mass. Medium of infinite space. And then that becomes, then your mind sort of seems to fill up, fill that up. And you move to a more subtle plane called the medium of infinite consciousness. And these mediums mean that you disappear into these states. You're not like a body floating in space. You're not like a mind being sort of peering around in the realm of infinite mind. You just have lost your personality, your infinite mind. You are infinite mind. You feel your infinite mind. And then that becomes a little bit also tiresome for you to be this big infinite mind with nothing much to do. So you go into absolute nothingness. You come to a threshold. And it seems as if you will no longer, you will be extinguished there. You will be extinct. And you feel that as a relief, actually, in that moment, because it's a yet more subtle state. You don't bother with philosophical, rational niceties about how nothing is nothing, so it can't be a medium. You just go into, you, you extinguish your awareness like falling asleep, actually. And then even that, somehow you're so concentrated by that time, you're so stable and steady that you go from there into a state said to be beyond cognition or non-cognition, or you could simply beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, you can say. Naiva samnya, naiva asamnya, ayatana, the medium of that. So you're somehow conscious of being unconscious. 
and unconscious of being conscious. It's in the realm of indescribable, you know, paradoxical, but it's considered the most subtle possible egocentric state. Although it feels to the person as if they, are they, are, they have incorporated the vastness of infinite space, infinite consciousness, and even nothingness, and they're embracing all of that. And yet, it's still just them, even though they don't say I there at all. So Buddha achieved these states, he said, and actually in his biography, although we can't necessarily rely on that, the veridity of that, but in his biography, he was a set acclaimed by teachers, yogi teachers and others, to have attained these states. And that fourth one is very similar to what in Hinduism they call nirvikalpa samadhi, non-conceptual concentration, or sometimes turiya, the fourth state. But Buddha clearly said these are not nirvana. He said, Nirvana is something, but it's not these. Nirvana is reality, but not these. Nirvana is just as much the reality of running around or being in hell as being in one of those super quiet states. He insisted. But he didn't emphasize. <laughs> He just left it out there for those who might have felt overwhelmed to take full responsibility for their state of delusion and might feel there's some place they can take their personality, their conflicted, ignorance-driven personality, closed personality, separated personality, there's some place they can take that that will be the final place, the final freedom of that personality. He knew they needed to feel that way. But then he left that hint. Those kind of states are not nirvana. Neither are all the many heavenly states that he described, actually, also. Now, this is not merely just, I'm not just professoring here. <laughs> this, is, it, it, this is conceptual and intellectual to understand, but it is something also that influences one's life and one's meditation. Why? Even you shut your mind into complete quiescence by becoming an adept at quiescence, shamatha, Unconsciously or subliminally, you still have a sense of where you are. You still are within a context, subliminally. For example, our culture, the modern culture, is within a context that if you reduce everything down completely, you reach the state of nothingness. That is to say, you, you become extinct upon death. That is the framework within which we live, and it's sort of reinforced by the fact that at night, when we fall asleep, we go unconscious and actually find it restful. We assume it's just from being unconscious that the rest comes without thinking necessarily about it. We look out in the sky at night, and we see some stars out there. And depending on what we know about astronomy, we realize the light is like millions of years old, or light years, you know, because they're light years away, and all this kind of thing. And really, there's just a dark space out there. And above our fragile atmosphere, then there, nothing can live. So it's kind of a death space, a death zone of nothingness. We have the common sense that inside the atoms that constitute our substantial world, habitual substantial world, 
there was like a nothingness, an empty space. And uh, so that context makes us feel that in, in some ultimate sense, we, our life, its purpose is sort of meaningless. It's not there. there there's, uh, it's, like we, it's inexplicably an accident, a random mutation, pure accident. And the scientists act like that's a discovered fact, even. And they, they assure us about that and look down on us if we try to say something, well, God has a purpose, or evolution has a purpose, or I have a purpose. And they're like, oh, yeah, great, OK, good, good. I hope that gets you through to the cemetery of heavenly rest, the law of eternal sleep, or whatever it's called. So that's one kind of context. Then in the older era, and still some people here in the West, the 55 million people who have moved in the last 40 years from mainstream religious denominations into born-again evangelical ones, they are going back into that older one where the context is this wonderful benevolent God so when you die, you'll be taking care, because then he sent Jesus, so he'll take care of you, or you're faithful to Allah, and he'll take care of you, or Yahweh, he'll take care of you. So there's a context that there's this God force, and, but then there's, there's sort of some very uneasy aspects of that, because there's all this threat from the scriptures of the different traditions that you're going to go to hell if you do the wrong thing. And that, that, so then you get the subliminally, that God is not that nice. <laughs> like, it's like, as a he, right? And then he's like, mean. He's going to send a lot of people he created. He's then going to send them off to roost. That's really, and it might be me if I, like, I don't know, have too much fun or something. And that really makes you uneasy, which, like, Calvin and people like that really belabored to indicate that some of you were created to be saved and some not ahead of time, no matter what you do. And, uh, but that's a context. And then if you a little bit touch the mystics, which you're not allowed that much to do in the Western religious tradition, they say, oh, it's just in infinite love. You know? So then you're all right when you die. You know? You'll be all right no matter what. They're just, uh, just a bluff, the business of hell. You know? Mystics kind of see that kind of. So that's another kind of context. And this is really, really important. That's why I said last night, Medicine Buddha, when you receive the teaching of Medicine Buddha, if we were lucky enough to have Medicine Buddha somewhere, or if we were back there in India, or whenever, they, whenever he manifests, in the field of such a being, then one sees everything as positive. And one feels at ease about death one feels at ease about surrendering to the luminosity, about letting go of one's boundary, about opening one's, one's you know, emotional armoring, Wilhelm Reich would have called it, or one's rigid sense of I'm fending off the universe, That's which I'm scared of, because it might do me in. Then if it all, if, then, then the, a really positive context makes one feel it's OK to let, let it let go. You know? float downstream. It's all OK. So this question of examining one's context is really, really meditatively important. And it takes a conscious effort to look at whatever contexts, cosmic contexts, are on offer and to sort of see what is the evidence for these different contexts. And what is the, what is the, uh, therefore, what is practical to try to cultivate the awareness of? To change what, oh, this is a very big important point, the difference of Buddhist psychology and Western psychology, modern, you know, contemporary psychology. And that is, you know, from Freud on, people thought that the unconscious is automatically and inevitably unconscious. And you know, you just try to balance it's it's you try to get any kinks out of it, any bottlenecks in there, any traumatic 
cramps and so forth that will make you consciously unfunctional. But in principle, it will remain unconscious. And that's why dreams, you shouldn't try to be a lucid dreamer because the dreams are where messages can come to you from the unconscious if you just let them be spontaneous. But that's within a contemporary worldview, materialist worldview, where you're only concerned with your mental ease and unease in this life. For the Buddhists, that's not good enough. For the Buddhists, although the unenlightened person has a hugely powerful unconscious, and they're very much driven by, by emotional impulses and, 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 and deep conceptual structures that they're not conscious of, that's unacceptable. The purpose and the opportunity of the human lifetime is to become conscious of that unconscious. And that is what all the meditation and all the study and all the contemplation, all the teachings are all about. Methods how to drill down into that unconscious and make it conscious and change the instinctual impulses that drive one to be more consciously directable, cultivate the positive drives, because the human being has many positive, loving, compassionate, sensitive drives. Or they, that's how they got to be, how we got to be human beings. And because the point is, when you die, your whole mind goes with you in its, in its subtle form, just like you know, the qualities. You know, if you look like your parents or your grandparents, some aspects of your physiognomy, you know, your earlobe resembles your grandmother, or your nostril looks like your father, or whatever it might be. Your chin is like your uncle or something, you know. Uh, you color hair, you know, eye color. That's a very amazing process where their physical um, quality or property gets boiled down into a genetic code in a molecule some sort of four-letter code thing, <laughs> the original bunch of four-letter words, going down and down in some spiral, marvelous thing recently discovered. And then it gives signals to your proteins that you get in the womb, and then you get after you get are born. And then you build up, and you have the same shape. That's an amazing. That's like an inconceivable, magical thing if you meditate on it. So similarly, your mind's more coarse properties, you know, your major habits of your mind, they kind of boil down into something called your gotra, your like a gene, your spiritual gene, your, your Buddha gotra, your Bodhisattva gotra, your whatever kind of gotra it is. And that gotra is like it encodes your behavioral patterns, and your, which include your thought patterns, not just physical behavior and verbal behavior, but also thought behavior. And then you build up to, you, then you probably gravitate toward parents whose physical genes relate to having behaved in certain ways, uh, so that the three genes, there's some sort of connection there in some micro level. And then also you start manifesting some of your previous life's habits in the next life. And the more free of being unconsciously driven you are at the death, rebirth, transition, death between rebirth, transition, then the more consciously you can choose your parents, your culture, your race, your species, your society, and finally your neighborhood. <laughs> That's one of my favorite. That's one of my books that I probably won't write in this life. How to be reborn in Los Angeles, <laughs> or on the east side, or you know, something like that. Because you know, there's this time in the Book of the Dead, where Book of Natural Liberation, where the dreamlike embodiment of the soul being, or the spiritual gene-bearing being, cruises around and sees lots of couples getting it on in the human plane and then falls in love with one of them and sort of wants to get into the action. It's like an Oedipal or Electra event prior to conception. I think it's quite marvelous. Thousands of years before Freud and his discovered the Oedipal thing. Marvelous thing. Anyway, 
So what I thought today, today the main theme today to meditate on, which in a way we've been doing, starting with the Heart Sutra and then working backwards. And I hope you learned the no nose meditation. That's a really important one. But the main theme is where the path begins in the Indian and Tibetan way of organizing the path to enlightenment. Now the first step in the path, actually death, and meditation on death is the second step. The very first step before doing the death meditation is what's called meditating on the precious jewel of a human embodiment endowed with liberty and opportunity, which is yourself, which you have. If you're listening to that teaching and understanding any language, Sanskrit or Tibetan or English or whatever it may be, that's considered the place to start. Because under unrealistic worldviews, people have the idea that sort of being human is just some, well, in the modern one, it's an accident, right? Meaningless accident. And if it's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're healthy and if you have good circumstances and you're lucky enough and you're lucky, then you can be a semi pleasurable experience until you reach a certain age, as long as you stay reasonably well and free of accidents. But, and then it's over and it had no ultimate meaning. It's just a, like a random event in the universe. And then in uh, theistic traditions, it's made by a god. In the image of God, there's a puzzling thing, they say, because, of course, God is imagined as some kind of superhuman. And the purpose is to, I guess, to become like God. In the West, they get a little nervous about being too much like God. You know, it, then they sort of execute mystics who act like I am God, like occasionally they do. But uh, sort of be like God, meaning loving, kind, uh, maybe wise, although they don't emphasize wisdom, faithful. And so there is a bit of a purpose. And uh, then one wants to get to heaven, you know. But in the Buddhist thing, it's, it's a kind of a midway between, between the two in a funny way. Nobody created it. There's no such person to be blamed or praised for the whole shebang in, there, in Buddha's view. And Buddha got that view according to the scriptures, the Pali scriptures, actually, as well as Mahayana. He got that view by meeting God. Do you know that sutra, Kevada Sutta, in Pali? Well, it wasn't Buddha in that one. There's another one where he meets in one of the Jataka tales. But in that one, a monk... A seeking monk meets, uh, who's a, not a Buddhist, but he's a yogi, a samana, shamana, and he meets Brahma. And he comes up to Brahma and he says, okay, great Brahma. I'm, you know, he goes in subtle body, you know, meditatively to the Brahma heaven. And he says, I've heard you've created the world. I'm a yogi who wants to understand it fully. Please tell me how you did it. What, what, ex what was there before earth, water, wind, fire, space, and consciousness? And then Brahma's answer to him is, basically, do you have an appointment? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, you know who I am? I'm great Brahma. And this and that. And he goes on. He recites it two or three times. And the yogi keeps saying, well, I know you are. I'm not saying you're not. But I didn't ask you that. I just want to know how it works and how you did it and, and how, what's happening. So then Brahma won't answer. So then he leaves. He withdraws from that heavenly plane. But as he's leaving, it's like a Wizard of Oz kind of story. Brahma comes out right. himself and meets him in some intermediary space and says, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. And then first he's a little nervous. He thinks Brahma's going to scold him or punish him or something. Then Brahma says, no, 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 no. I, I, you're a real seeker and a yogi, and I have to answer you. It would be very wrong of me to brush you off. The thing is, what happened is, when this particular material world arose from like a big, a big, um, you know, a big arise or big bang, but it's not a bang, it's kind of a more slow thing in the Indian cosmology. It is when it arose, I was the first person here, and there was nobody else around, and I kind of wondered like, where is everybody? Like, where am I? What am I doing here? Sort of thing. And as I was wondering that, all these other godlings that you saw there in my throne room, you know, in my heaven, they appeared, and when they saw me, they said, Dada, 
And first I said, I'm not your Dada. Like, give me a break. What's happening? And then they looked so threatened and freaked out. I said, OK, OK, I'm your Dada. Everything is fine. It's all under control. <laughs> it's like Alexander Haig in the White House, you know. It's all under control. And, uh, and ever since, are you OK? Do you need, uh, who's, who's having a cough there? Can we get you some water or something? You're OK? OK. And then, uh, and then the, the Brahma said, uh, so I have to tell you, I admit that to you, you know, because you're a real seeker and you're asking the wrong person. The person who understands how evolution works is the Buddha down there, on the, who's down in India right now. So you should go and ask him. And he will explain it to you, uh, whatever best way for you to understand it. And then there's two more things I want you to do. You first, ask him to explain it to me. And I, I, when he, because Buddha, in the, even in Pali Sutras, Buddha goes to the different heavens, actually. It's not like Pali is all very humanoid. He goes to those heavens and he teaches those gods, he teaches his mother in one of them who's in, who's in um, Indra's heaven and so on. And he teaches other ones too and helps them because they get very upset, the gods, because when they've been gods for a billion years, type thing, and then they fall down, it's very, everything is terrible. They don't want to really be in some lower plane, you know. And uh, he consoles them and teaches them what to do and tries to get them to think about it when they're in, in their party land, you know, heaven, bliss land. Uh, so pleasure land, uh, he tries to get them to think about the longer term and to use their tremendous divine intelligence to study the Dharma. And apparently many of them do, actually, they say. So anyway, this, and that's the first thing. And then the second thing is ask Buddha to tell the human beings when horrible things happen to them, it isn't my fault because I'm not omnipotent and I didn't create evil, you know, which is the Buddhist answer to the, to the theodicy problem of the monotheist. So there's actual in the thing, you know. So the context that, but then the, the, so the, so maybe it's sad. Some of the Indians in Buddha's time and subsequently were sad that Buddha, who supposedly became enlightened to, by discovering the nature of reality, he said, no, there, you know, Vishnu, Shiva, and they didn't create everything. And I didn't create everything. Nobody created everything. We're all constantly co-creating it through a process of causation, which he called karma which really means evolution, actually, evolutionary causation. It's a constant evolution, but one that can go up or down. You know? And that's a causal process. You know? And uh, his karma theory, I, I consider it a biological theory of how life is shaped and formed, which includes mind as a force in nature instead of just pretending it's all some um, atoms and molecules and genes. You know? That's part of it, but there's also the minds of beings. You know? And it's more radical than Darwin. Darwin just says, you know, and the creationists are freaked about Darwin because your Texas creationist doesn't want to have genes like a chimpanzee, you know, which would also mean like a black person or a Mexican. You know, they, they want to go with Donald Trump and build a big wall. <laughs> they, wanna, they don't want to be female. They don't want to whatever it is. They, they, so they, they, they want to be like a white god, you know, like they have in those things in San Diego, that famous thing of the fundamentalists. So, but Buddha would, people who listened to Buddha and all the people in India subsequently, they didn't mind. Not only did they don't mind having G chimpanzee genes, they don't mind having been a chimpanzee, personally. And again, danger of being an, again a chimpanzee if they act too chimp-like, you know, or gravitate toward a chimp. And like, I, we, we had one Lama who lived with us in Amherst, who was really upset by Miss Piggy. He was so upset. He, I mean, he liked Miss Piggy, too, but he was very upset. He said, what would happen to a young person, child, who watched a lot of Miss Piggy and fell in love with her and then died in an auto accident or some disease or something, and then was like, in the between state, he would head toward the pig world <laughs> because he's so much like Miss Piggy. And we said, remember, said, don't be so upset. It's just a, it's an animal fairy tale. The Buddhist form of life stories, the Buddha was a pig, and Buddha was a dog. And they did. He said, yeah, but they weren't watching him on television 20 hours a day, he said, <laughs> and getting imprinted on the, on the beauty of Miss Piggy. <laughs> so he was not relenting on that. He was very worried about interfering with the karma of some poor young person. But, because we will make a choice in the between state, according to them, how we get reborn, depending on 
what our aptitudes and what our inclinations are, and how we have cultivated. So my point is, and, and, to have gotten to be human, we were immensely ethical as other kinds of animals. That is considered like a naturalistic, you know, natural science result. It's a theory, Buddha's theory about evolution. We evolved into the human form because when we were tigers, we, you know, tigress, right? And we, there was a herd of wildebeest running along, and there was one pregnant wildebeest going there. And we somehow, subliminally, without language and without having you know, read WebMD or anything, we identified with having been pregnant with cubs ourselves, and we let her go. And we jumped on some awful, stringy old guy who, we knew who would be like a rough chew. But you know, we just only chew up one of them, not two of them. And you know, your, your materialist biogrammarians say that we're, that we, the tigress, the tigress does that in order to have another one to eat later, which is so silly projecting aggressive predatoriness into the thing. It's just a subliminal thing because the animal can't stop and think to identify with the other animal because they don't have the, 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 but by that kind of little self-restraint, that's ethical. It's considering the, the embryo of the wildebeest, the little baby wildebeest in the womb, and the mother, the mother wildebeest. It's some kind of subliminal identification with that thing. And from that animal thing, built up over a million lifetimes of different kinds of animals, one comes to be this weird creature that we are. It's not obvious that, that this is a good life form. Like we walk on two legs and our back hurts. You know, we can't run on four. We don't have a tail to hold onto a branch to get out of the way of a predator. We have our teeth suck. <laughs> They're terrible. We have no fangs. We can't spit poison. We, it's not obvious, like, really good way of a mighty hunter that we're going to become mighty hunters once we invent A-bombs or like Remington rifles or whatever, Archie Bunker. We have a Glock pistol. That's like a whole complex sort of feedback loops, a bunch of things are going there. So the, the Buddha's view is, although there's no ultimate human nature or no ultimate thing, any human being can be a serial murderer, mass killer, like a, a, like a Mao or something, you know, mass murderer person, Stalin, Mao, Hitler or something. And any human being can be a, a saint. And we are this very, very flexible because of the complexity of our, of our past, our identification process, our critical intellect, our self-shaping process. And so we are a being that, and also we're not too comfortable like in a heaven plane, like those gods are. We are angels and gods. We are in this sort of on the edge between quite a miserable, difficult, helpless state and some sort of too much pleasure, relaxed state. And we're sort of right there, vulnerable, open, completely able to change ourselves one way or another. And that is the precious human life endowed with liberty and opportunity. The liberty comes from not being born in hell or animal or in the wrong kind of God realm or something. And the opportunity comes from being in a place where there have been enlightened beings who have taught us. There have been great meditators like Dale come to teach us to turn inside and find out what's going on in there. And... Uh, and this is great. This is not everybody has that. It's very, very. You were saying last night rightly that how many people are sitting thinking about this kind of thing that we're thinking about last night on this planet? They're just rushing from pillar to post. A lot of them, most of them, like me. <laughs> so the precious human life. It, when you that's why I see realistic worldview, acceptance of causality, realizing that the idea of an uncaused cause or a first cause, or something coming from nothing is an asinine idea and completely irrational and unexemplified. Nowhere in nature can it possibly happen. The rule of common sense is continuity in all. And similarly, an end into nothing will also not happen. It all goes on forever. They kind of act like, oh, I'm a Buddha, my life, everything is over. The arhats in the dualistic Buddhism, they are constantly talking about how my job is done, have no more birth for me, you know, which, which you know, leads people to the misunderstanding that the Buddha is some, Buddhism is somehow anti-life. What they really say, they may, some of them may think that they're not going to be born again, 
But Buddha has another thing coming to them <laughs> later as he informed them in the Lotus Sutra and a few other places that there's no way in which something will ever become nothing. Nirvana is not nothing. And Nirvana is also not a place. It's uncreated. It's not a place you create by a causal process. You, the causal process is stripping away your failure to understand where you actually are already. That's a non-dualism. But, he, but, but they say that. And then even people say, oh, well, Buddha, what do you mean? Buddha doesn't get reborn. But Buddha is totally reborn. Poor guy. Nirmanakaya, the body of emanation of a Buddha, they, they say, by definition. Now, I don't know if it's true. Could be mass delusion, but it's one I prefer <laughs> to this mass delusion. And, but Nirmanakaya is, is, because you are infinite, right? Just think about it, by definition. You, you have become infinite. And to you, that's a blissful thing. That's your dharmakaya, reality body, and sambhogakaya, your beatitude body. Okay? But being one with everything means you're also one with every painful thought of every living being, infinitely. Not just even on one planet, infinitely. You are totally aware of them not realizing. You, um, you have a double vision. You see them as uninterrupted part of the ocean of bliss. No problem. But you see them not knowing that and being really having, thinking they're unhappy, but therefore being unhappy. They're taking themselves as a bunch of bliss, configuration of bliss, and configuring it so as to feel misery. And, uh, and, and you could always say, well, it's just their delusion, but they're still feeling it, and it still makes them miserable. So what is your oneness with them? How does it manifest? It manifests whatever medicine they need. Because you are one with the creative energy of the luminosity that makes everything. So you can't even resist being born, manifesting yourself in some specific way that fits with their specific configuration and distortion of confusion that makes them experience bliss as suffering, right? Which means ignorance, right? So you're Buddha born infinitely, in other words, reborn infinitely. They just don't emphasize it because people who find birth to be laborious would be freaked at the endless seva of being a Buddha. You know, Buddha is a servant of every suffering being. They say, I mean, they say it. They say Buddha, a Buddha, a Buddha, any one of you becoming one, or if you already have, considers every other sentient being the way it's specific one by one, the way a mother considers her only beloved child. In other words, that life and that making that suffering into a happiness is, the, is more important than some sort of manifestation of oneself. You know, if, you, if you're having trouble with your child as a mother and you hear that, you might think, poor guy. Because of course you don't know that it's possible for Buddha because of the intensity of the bliss of the awareness of luminosity, the deathless state where you, you are the vastness of life. You know, Amitayus, one of the names of Buddha called, which means boundless or immeasurable life, infinite life. So the precious human form, the form, so then in realistic world, when we get a realistic worldview like that, there's no end to the flow of causation. There's no beginning to the flow of causation. But in a, on, there is a level, though, where one can perceive it all as not happening in the sense that what makes it miserable is where one thinks it's really like this, you know, where one thinks it's this bunch of absolute things so that one's suffering is an absolute thing. So, so there's a somehow, and, then, and this goes into, the non-duality always goes into the realm of where you can't quite completely explain it all perfectly. You can only give vectors. But still, it means that that intensity of the bliss of this vastness and of having melted through into it, in the, into this life energy, and because it itself is bliss energy, meaning, bliss meaning, what does bliss mean? Mean, bliss means completely satisfying, and therefore naturally wanting everything that's enfolded in it to be satisfaction, that's all. And anything that's resisting that then becomes something to kind sort of flow around. But of course, 
It's skillful also because it's conscious. And uh, if you just sort of try to bomb things into bliss, what happens is that people, it's like hugging a paranoiac. They, they feel they're being assaulted and they become more rigidly defended. And they try to ward off this flow of energy. They don't, want, they don't embrace it. So the only way they can open is through their own understanding, opening that it's all right. You know? So then, then the, the realistic motivation, life motivation is the second branch of the Eightfold Path. And that motivation, once you realize, if you realize that your life, body, and mind are an evolutionary eye blink, a moment, in an, in an infinite path, from it coming from an infinite past, going toward a potentially infinite future, and you're this moment, you are, your life is a moment, not just that you're going to be in the moment, of this life, but your whole life is. And that moment, what you do in that moment, can determine the quality of that infinite future big time. You then become where there's no other sensible purpose to this life than opening to the luminosity by whatever method there is. That is really the highest priority it becomes, right? And then, so when, and you really get jacked up, and that's why it's the first in the path, because then you're motivated to really use your life in a sensible way. And that's why those people who met Buddha in the ancient time, they would just come into his field, they would just see him, and they would say, okay, I'm with you. And he would say, eh, hey, bhikkhu, which bhikkhu, by the way, doesn't mean monk, it means mendicant. So it can, it's only possible in a society where there is a free lunch, unlike ours. Because mendicant means one who lives on alms food you know, and asks for free lunch. Not breakfast, not dinner, just lunch. So, so he says, he says eh, bhikkhu, you know, come here, mendicant. And then they change their clothes. They're, like a, so they, 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 they're recruited immediately because they somehow feel, they see the possibility of being this kind of entering this field of bliss and becoming a node of bliss for all beings. And they see that, you know. Even though they might interpret it as it means they sort of have to send their mind elsewhere to some nirvana. And they don't see it, they don't see the immediate possibility of that. Which is not, which is complicated because you have to unravel something surgically very carefully. You can't just smash through it. Right? And then the second thing, once you realize how precious that is, then you meditate on death with what are said to be the three roots of the meditation on death, which is the first one is overcoming the denial that you will die. And here the Buddhists would say that, well, everyone intellectually knows that they will die. When you meditate on the certainty that I will die, if you go deeper, you realize that sort of on some level, more subliminal level, you act like you'll always be there. The way that, you know, the way you are. You'll always be your one unchanging point of personality. It will always be you. And uh, so you're, you're, you know, we act like we're always having endless tomorrows. You know, we put off things. We procrastinate. We think we'll go to the, we'll go to the, mm, on retreat later, you know, whatever. After we finish this, after we make our million, then we'll go off and meditate and become enlightened sort of thing. Now in Silicon Valley, there, it's a billion, I think. million is more much now. So, so that's the first route. And then you get really certain that you will die and you, that you suddenly realize, therefore, every minute is really precious. Then the second route is said to be the uncertainty when it will be <laughs> could be your last any time. Then that gets you even more pumped up and intensified. And then the third route is that when you do, only your super subtle mind, your spiritual gene, Will, will be what you take with you. So what are you invested in your openness, to, your super subtle mind, and a, a synonym for that could be openness to luminosity. What are you investing in your openness to luminosity? And the way you invest, how do you invest in your openness to luminosity? How do you open yourself? Well, you give gifts. You let go of something you really like that you think you should keep. You let go of it. That opens you, that act. You mentally let go of some credible attachment that opens you. You know, then you're, you think of someone else's situation. When you interact with someone, you think of how it's impacting them. You're ethical. You're ethical, and you want them to, want them to get something from it. 
and you see it from their point of view, what it is that they want, and you, you act accordingly, uh, you know, then that's being ethical. And that opens you, because you restrain maybe what you just only think about what you want. And then someone hurts you, and then instead of reacting angrily, you use that to, to build your tolerance. And you realize that they did so because of their confusion, because they were gripped by some negative emotion that has them working like a robot, you know, and they don't know what they're doing, and they're, they're, having, they're going to have get worse trouble, and having, they're going to be more worse hurt in the future than, than you are, et cetera. So you, you, have, you develop what they call the shield of patience or tolerance. And then you become creative about, uh, you become creative about opening yourself and doing more and being more and thinking more. And then you get into meditating and you get into critical thinking, you know, wisdom. So you do those paramitas, you know, those transcendent practices and virtues. And then you become a, you know, a more enlightened being. You use this human life really fantastically. It becomes the platform of uh, infinite positive progression. If you don't attain Buddhahood in this life right away, you, you will at some life, absolutely. The other thing about it is, remember when Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, he had a big shock before attaining nirvana. Well, in a way, it was, I think he was so close to nirvana, it didn't shock him that much. But if you remember the story in whatever version you heard, all of the versions agree that he first remembered infinite previous lives of himself. You know, beginningless previous lives, he remembered in every detail. So his, the mind's expanse into infinitude is also in time as well as space. And that was first thing. And I, I, th I believe he could do that then because he was at the bliss boundary of nirvana and so he realized he'd always been in nirvana in all those previous lives. Even though some of them had been hell, some of them had been here, but he realized because he realized nirvana was uncreated and has always been here. So he shifted the context, that the nirvanic context of, you know, he was at that point of final veil of ignorance being drained. And he was, he was even seeing the past as having been nirvana. He was revising his memory, his experience of those past things. He was revising that as having, oh, I was actually in nirvana then when I was roasting on a fire or when I gave my, I remember he gave his body as a rabbit to a traveler jumped in the fire to be cooked as rabbit burgers. Remember? So, but then it wasn't any more painful to him when, when he was at that phase. He, was, he just saw that as a part of the play of bliss. And then, he, second, he remembered everybody else's previous lives. And, you know, you can't say, therefore, that your beloved Theravada, where's my Theravada fanatic over there? You can't say that your beloved Theravada doesn't teach compassion because if you had infinite previous lives and you remember them in detail, and everyone else did too, and you remember them in detail, then you, you, you are completely confronted with your total entanglement with every single being, beginningless entanglement, that it's all one being. And you've been in every conceivable relationship with every single one. And so their, your feelings are their feelings and vice versa. You know, is that, but without mentioning the word compassion, I just say he remembered everybody else's previous lives. Then he saw all their future potential destinies. And um, so he had to unfold their futures uh, as well. You know? And, then, uh, then, uh, and then, then he attained uh, the termination of all outflows, as they say, or contamination, which is nirvana. But then the great thing about Buddha, which I really liked, well, I like a lot of things about him, but one of them was at that point he smiled. You could attain knowledge, full knowledge and experiential knowledge of reality, and you could go, oh no, what a bummer, how awful. And then I better not tell anybody about it, though I freaked them out. They could say, ignorance is bliss in this case, right? But he didn't say that. He said, ignorance is suffering. Actually, if you know what's going on, you'll be blissful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, he smiled, in other words. That was a great thing. That's one thing I liked about him. And then, then the second thing, he said, okay, now I'm a Buddha. I know everything, and I'm happy. 
But I don't say you have to believe that. He didn't say. I'm not demanding this kind of blind faith belief. Oh, oh he's a, he says he's a Buddha, and he's kind of cute looking now. They all did think he was cute. He was like golden rays. He had big earlobes and extra scoop on his head. He was very great looking. But he said, someone else will come up and be cuter and tell you a bunch of baloney. So you shouldn't believe what people tell you just because you think there is something. You should, what, what I'm asking you to do only is try this out yourself. Be realistic about your worldview. Be motivated to use your life in a, according to whatever you think is reality, etc. Cultivate, calm your mind. Be ethical, meditate, and learn the nature of reality. Because I'm confident that you can understand it. And that's all I'm saying. Try it. If it doesn't work, forget about it. If it works, if you start feeling better, if you start becoming more confident about what I've told you, then, then you start giving me some credibility. But that's all, that's all I ask, he said. Use your intelligence yourself. You know? And particularly, they say, if you think that my analysis of emptiness and of the two realities, relative and absolute, and that there can't be an absolute in the relative, and therefore your sense of your own absoluteness or the object's absoluteness is, is the key root distortion that you have, and if you find that to be true and you really come more into your relatedness with the world in a better way, then, then you can give me credibility about things that I tell you that you can't immediately verify such as future life and things like that. But the key thing is, what is your own nature? You look at it. And if, if you find that the, the path of analyzing yourself and discovering that all those things you thought were solid dissolve under analysis, and if my, if my, my method there proves helpful to you, my wisdom method there proves helpful to you, then I, I deserve some credibility. And that's how we did it. He didn't just demand that he, that he was an authority you know, at all. So I think that's really good. That's like a good, a good teacher is like that. They don't, they learn as they teach, even they're teaching the same thing a hundred times. They learn something new when they're doing it. Because, you know, there, there is this endlessness about life. Okay, I got it. Don't be bully now. Yeah, okay, they're playing. I thought they were saying that was enough. It is almost not enough. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Uh, please speak loudly, and also I will find my hearing aid. But I can't hear you. One metaphor that I struggle with is the concept of an enlightened Buddha. Concept of? Of an enlightened Buddha. Yeah. It feels attached to me a Buddha's caring for all sentient beings. Yes. As if a mother for her child. Yes, right. To me, I've always struggled with that because that feels like the most attached state. Right. I know it. Right. Well, in a way, you're right. In other words, uh, if if you if you feel you are your body then you feel attached to your body, right? Because you are it. So for example, when you put your hand on a hot pot, you immediately remove it and do whatever you can to try to stop the pain and to heal it without a bad blister, blah, blah, blah. And it's a natural thing. And uh, now, you could shift that attachment even if you have an idea of something that the universe is all luminosity and made of bliss and something like that, and you could say, I'm only attached, I'm only, well, I only identify with being luminosity. So then you feel you, you could drop attachment to your body and you could shoot for the luminosity. Fuck, they're being attached over there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in other words, whatever you are, however you identify yourself, even if you identify yourself by being unconscious. You're on the thre of course, when you're unconscious, you're unconscious. But you could be at the threshold and say, OK, I leap into the void here, like I'm an existentialist. Then you're attached to being nothing. Then if you find out you're not nothing, you're going to be upset. <laughs> so Buddha's predicament is that he feels he is everyone. Now, 
the, and the, the lucky part about it is the only way you get there is by melting through bliss into a, feel, into a oneness with all of everyone, something like that, like a vast orgasm, like an infinite orgasm, it's all, although that's a contradiction in terms perhaps as well. Once it's infinite, <laughs> there's nothing more to melt. But, but that sort of enables, I guess that means that, that um, it becomes, they, you know, they like to say it's an attachment, but it's a spontaneous attachment. The Buddha's, you know, liberative effort on behalf of all beings of emanating infinite bodies to whatever, whatever embodiment or whatever phenomenon Buddha can emanate as a building, as a planet, as a, an ocean, as a stream, as a tree. They, they don't care in the Mahayana vision of the Buddha. And uh, it's just effortless because it is just the, it's the clear light itself enfolding that being and whatever that being needs to be enfolded in in order to have their ultimate opportunity to discover their own reality. So, you know, when you take any word, even the word attachment, if we think of it as negative, then, and you push it to some whatever level, I think language is like that, it can have a positive meaning, actually. They even say, if you see a Buddha on the road, kill the Buddha. Well, kill is a negative thing. But when they mean, what they mean there is don't, to, you know, analytically have dissolve under analysis your projection into that being that that's what a Buddha is and not yourself. In the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is a Mahayana text I highly recommend to everybody, especially my translation, <laughs> although I don't get a royalty, so don't worry, uh, though I gave it away. Uh, there's a scene where Vimalakirti, who's considered like a Buddha emanation, but as a layman, meets Shakyamuni Buddha in, a, in the middle of a big gathering and then Shakyamuni Buddha says, well, you and your, your companions in the gathering came over to see me. Now you see Buddha. What do you see? And he says, I don't see Buddha when I see a body standing here in front of me. I don't see a Buddha. And he goes through this long, dissolve under analysis, critical, critical passage where he, it's a basically no eye, no ear, no nose, you know, that sort of thing. But standing face to face with Shakyamuni Buddha in, in a moment. And Shakyamuni is, is like, right, you know, because he, he, in a way he's saying, since both of them are Buddhas in a way, one lay Buddha, one monk Buddha, one mendicant Buddha, they're both trying to teach the people who are listening to them that they feel completely as much the other person as themselves. Do you follow me? And in that sense, in a way, I don't know, is there something flying? Is it a bird? What was that? I'm seeing a shadow. I did too. Could be a bat or a bird, something. Anyway, uh, they say that, um, and again, what does attachment mean when you are what you're attached to? Right? This, the, the mother, the only child, is like to indicate the very powerful commitment of all enlightened beings to us, which is really important because, see, this now, this maybe is my ma main thing where I connect also to Dale, although we can discuss this in, in, in dialogue tonight. But, you know, the context of us, our life, this planet, America, this 20th century, common era century, it's some other person's 400th century or something, you know? But, you know, that's really important. We walk around in a context. And we actually are inflicted culturally in a rather backward culture, I'm sorry to say, the West is even though it has dominated the planet through violent conquest of colonialism and many genocides. But it's rather backward. And one of the biggest problems of it is we're all put in the context that we're supposed to be miserable. We're not supposed to feel good. We're not supposed to succeed. It's all doomed. Therefore, oh, yeah, sure, climate change, everybody going underwater. You know, no air or nuclear holocaust. Oh, okay, yeah, well, it's inevitable. Can't help it. And then this accident, this, then we're given the palliation, the alleviation that it's all nothing anyway, so we won't regret it when it all blows up. When, when the Death Star destroys the planet, you know, there's no Obi-Wan outside who's going to say, oh, there was a disturbance in the Force. It's all over. Nobody will remember that it ever happened. That's a really negative context. And it makes, it, 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 it 
And if you are as radical as I am nowadays, that Buddha's analysis is that the unenlightened person is actually psychotic. What do you do? How you would define a psychotic? Which, of course, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be insulting anybody. Nobody wants to think of themselves as a psychotic, of course. <laughs> but, but if you think you're something that you're not, if you think your reality is something that it isn't, then you, that's the definition of a psychotic. They're in an unreal reality, and they're locked off from connecting to the real reality. And if you say that's the case, then things like everything is ultimately nothing, and it doesn't matter, or there's some sort of an absolute being outside everything who can, if you just say the right word, or you belong to the, have the right credit card or membership card, that would, they'll, you'll be okay and everybody else will go to hell. Any of these negative, and that this is supposed to be a veil of misery to test you and all that, all of these things put you in a context where you are. It increases, you know, I wish I really was something else that wasn't here. This can't work here. It's just awful. And, uh, and so why bother? You know? Well, maybe be a, only bother would be to be a little more comfortable in this re whatever remaining time I, I, I'm, I'm uh, occupying this body. There's no other higher thing to do. Excuse me? Uh, well, no, and, and uh, ver versions of, yes, yeah, versions of Judeo-Christian, yes. Versions, of which, but you never should say Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Christo-Islamic, because it's all one flow. And, but the Hindu monotheists are, are sort of similar, but a little bit less because they had connection to this other vision of the success, the glory, the beauty of the human form and the human opportunity, you know. And the fact that it is all clear light, you know. What was it, the Albigensians? The Albigensians uh, in the south of France there, Carcassonne, this place, they thought everything was kind of paradise already. It was good. It was the, the new age was already here. And the, what that pope went and killed all of them because it's bad for people to think everything can be fine, you know. That's really no good. We ought to keep them under the yoke, you know. So I think, no, I just, I don't think it's specifically that. I think China also, like, a little bit had that. But I think the... Basically, the cultures, uh, civilizations that were conquered are probably the better, more gentler ones than the ones who conquered. Especially because actually they invented most of the technologies that enabled their conquest, but didn't use them to conquer other people. They stayed in their place, more or less, because they were having a happier time you know, with their ragas and their good Chinese vegetable cooking. They didn't, they didn't eat the awful food. Have you ever read one of those histories of culture in Europe about how what bread was like shoe leather? And like, you know, the French didn't serve hot food to the aristocracy until the 1890s. And Mr. Escoffier and the Ritz. You know that stuff that King Louis XIV had on the, you know, the, the swans and the goose and the palaces made of this? That was the, that was the food that they then had to eat after looking at it. And it was all sculpted like that in lard and served cold. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they died young. <laughs> and they, they I'm never mind. I mean, I, it's, uh, that's kind of just humorous. But my point, I'm trying to stick with the context, you know, because in a way, that's what Menla is dedicated to. You know, it's, it's my own consolation prize. I usually save it to the end, but nowadays I'm doing it early in retreats. You know, people ask me sometimes, are you enlightened? And I have to be honest and tell them no. And then they look very worried because I've been studying for 50 years, whatever. <laughs> and I spoke Tibetan in six weeks, so I probably was Tibetan in a previous life. And after all that, you know, I'm still not enlightened. So then they get upset. So then I say, no, but I do have a consolation. I have a consolation prize. And my, I've been developing in recent years. It's become stronger and stronger to me. And it has to do with what I said about Buddha remembering previous lives. See, Nirvana, if it's, you know, he, in, in the Tibetan, when he attained enlightenment, he said, profound, peace, luminous, uncomplicated, and most important, uncreated. Like an elixir of immortality is this reality that I have discovered. He said, you know, like an amrita, you know, elixir. 
deathlessness, in other words. That's the deathlessness in our course description. <laughs> but uncreated means it's not made of causes and conditions. It means that the only way it can be uncreated and still exist is if it's always been here, if it is actually the eternal reality of everything. It's nirvana, right? And, and, this and in non-duality, it's experienced by two different types of beings, one that knows that and one that doesn't know that. And the one that doesn't know that is really struggling against the flow and have fighting and feeling miserable and having problems which includes all the types of lower animals, you know, one eating another, subsistence livelihood, who's going to eat me, you know, you know, fighting with the, with the other, right? Then the human, then the, the gods also, they just, they're just, you know, they're just in the jacuzzi. The other is a billion-year jacuzzi or something. So they're just not really focusing, you know. They get overindulged. So the human is the one that's still doing that like, that, like the predatory animal, or whatever, or the predated animal, but can think it through you know, and can figure it out. And then Buddhas did that, millions of, in the countless numbers of Buddhas. And they're enjoying that thing. So my consolation prize is that although I'm not enlightened and I, I am self and other, self and othering away up and down the highway, as that wonderful guy in Kentucky farmer says, just keep driving. Americans, whatever it is, just keep driving. You know, that's his description of the climate, climate change. Anyway, whatever it is, when I do attain nirvana in some life fully, you know, when I become a Buddha, some life or another, which, because they've given infinite chance, even me, I can't miss, right? You have infinite opportunity. We all can't miss. All of you can't miss. You're going to be Buddhas. Tough luck. Then you realize you always were. Yeah, so then all of us here, when we're both Buddhas, whenever it happens to whichever of us, then we'll realize we were right now in Nirvana, right here today at 5.47 p.m. on Friday. It's Nirvana now, but we don't enjoy it fully now because we don't know it's here. But that's the consolation. We will be Nirvanically present retroactively. What do you think, Nina? I heard what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, luckily, huh? I've been consoling with my, myself with that for a while. <laughs> luckily. Very good. But, but I know that. Is there anything else that you're thinking? I'm thinking that you really have some questions. Yeah, more questions. I think it's great to get the dinner. Yes, we're going to stop soon. We started a little late. Any other question? Anybody have any other question? That we move to dialogue. Yes. I have a sort of um, ignorant, cut to the chase question. Um, if the Lama says, you know, we so worried about thinking about Miss Piggy in yes. the clear light of the voice, what's the suggested navigational thought before? What's the suggestion for who? Navigational thought. What's the oh. Navigational thought? Yeah. You mean not to be Miss Piggy? Oh, well, no, the best outcome for the child who dies, of course. No, I mean oh. the best solution for sure, all of us. Instead of just being Miss Piggy, what, could there, what should there be that one should be watching? Oh, oh, oh is that right? What program should you watch? No, it's not the answer to this question. But if the Matrix. Find, if Avatar. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. If we find ourselves there. Yes. Clear light of the void. If that's how it works. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, the map, yes. We're coming to the map. Okay. Uh, you know, this, this retreat is about the map. I'm sorry, I didn't get I was just <laughs> staying with the basics here, okay, okay. about the preciousness of the life okay. and the context. But the map, then, given, given we can at least imaginatively, temporarily, while at Menla, or, of course, you all may have other experiences and ways of doing that, once you get a context where you begin to think that you could understand anything new, you have unlimited potential, you will manage to confront these things. You can open to the thing. In other words, once you get out of feeling that you can't, you know, then the, the map is, is what the Tibetan Book of the Dead 
provide. And, there, and then it does so on the claim of a scientific report, actually, accumulated by many people who experienced this and who did so lucidly and then made the description. It's a tradition in Buddhism called Abhidharma. Dharma means, can mean teaching or reality. Abhidharma means organized teaching, something like that, you know, or super, super teaching and uh, sort of scientific teaching. And uh, the, the, the thing is that when you die, you know, there are these eight, you, you don't know about the eight states of melting and so forth, you know about those? I've heard these on your podcast. Yeah, oh, you heard that on a podcast. Yeah, well, there, you know, you, you, it's like your body goes to sleep. You know, you can't, your motor, ner your motor, last to go is the motor thing, you can't move. Your, your ability to recognize things gets lost. You have a kind of hallucinatory thing. You then see kind of light flashing, feel like you're in clouds or in smoke. And then eventually you come to this luminous space. And then, unfortunately, the luminous space can be spoiled for you if you are not, you haven't trained yourself instead of watching Miss Piggy or even Avatar if you have not trained yourself to let go into luminosity, where you can sort of let go of feeling, like right now, if I sit, right, you know, then the body is here, you know, and then I have a concept of being in my body. You, 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 do, you aren't actually naturally in your body. You have a concept of being in your body. Your brain has a model of your body that, that it then thinks you're sitting in a certain way. And then you, 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 if you develop concentration, you get where you don't necessarily identify yourself as just being your body. You can go into a visionary field. You can go into those higher contemplative states where you are just kind of fields of emotion, positive, like infinite love, infinite, you know, the, the four dhyanas. And you can do that kind of thing. And all those things are good, because, especially if you're armed with common sense knowledge that any state you might enter that might be some sort of vastness or something is not... It's, once you enter it, it's, not a, it's a relative state. It's not an absolute state. So you won't be stuck or come, you won't transfer your attachment too much to that state. And, uh, but the more you get used to letting go, you know, then the more better you'll be at that time of coming into the moonlight, sunlight, dark light, and then the most subtle one, the transparency, which is kind of the map. And the more you, you mo and then there are these 80 instincts, you can learn what they are. And some of them are like where your mind becomes like a little Pac-Man that wants to eat things, <laughs> you know, and wants to like grab onto things. Because, you know, we're used to, like in a dream, when you're in a dream, you also are an, a, a separated embodiment in the dream in an environment. And you're reacting to things that happen to you and trying to control it and not have bad things happen, run away from them if they're bad, embrace them if they're good. And you're, you, so you're reproducing what you're used to, which is being sort of a, a motorized entity that an awareness that reacts to things around it that are not it. So that's what one's comfort zone sort of is, when it's going well. And, um, and when it doesn't, then one just wants to get back to where it is. And if you let those, if you let those unconscious drives will interfere with the feeling of the spacious whiteness and redness and orangeness and darkness, and then, then completely at the rest place, which is the transparency, where the self-other thing completely dissolves. Uh, these instincts will drive one, and one will shoot past that clear thing. And then one will gravitate toward what one is used to again. But in a way, that's not bad. I do think, personally, that the Buddhists exaggerate uh, the danger of the sort of limbic brain, which in neuroscience called the limbic brain thing, but in the Buddhist case, it would be the fact that we can identify with animal forms and where we would then gravitate like, like someone who was a B-52 pilot and really into their plane, they might be interested in the form of a dragonfly or you know, someone who was a tank person, never mind a Volkswagen owner, <laughs> beetle. You know, they might think that's a good body. I want a body like that. And they would gravitate towards beetle-like or, or rhinoceros like rhinoceros things if they were tank drivers. You know, they might think rhinoceros was a good thing. Why have to go get one and like, go to the motor pool and put gas in it? Just be one. You know? I think a lot of our tools, human tools, are modeled on animal form. And therefore, there's a danger of someone to identify that one might go toward that. So, so 
you know, and a warrior bristling with swords and armor and live by killing samurai, you know, they might feel like some kind of tiger or lion. You know, they wear them in their battles, right? Those helmets, you know, they have like uh, fierce animal fangs on their helmets, things like that, horns, you know. So it's a matter of cultivating identification. There is, a, and, and the key there is, if one has practiced releasing all identification, you know, no identity, no nose, no attainment, no non-attainment. One's practiced that a lot. Then the more one, deeper one practices that, the more conscious one becomes of the unconscious, the more one can shape the negative things, and fears and aggressions and lusts and, and uh, dissatisfactions and uh, angers and things, and uh, diminish their power and increase the power of positive things and creativity and free free artistry, let's say, imaginative artistry. And, uh, and then one can sort of gravitate toward more and more beautiful forms. For example, they do say that beauty in the human life comes from having cultivated patience in former life. And uh, ugliness comes from being aggressive and predatory. And uh, predatory animals do occult, uh, have a kind of, you know, we say tiger, tiger, burning bright, but when one is eating us, we're not really thinking how beautiful it is. <laughs> unless, we were, unless we're Buddha, actually, in his previous life as a bodhisattva, where he gave himself to a tigress to prevent her eating her cubs. So, so the, those, are the, those are the programs. Those are the, those are the things. And, and what, uh, what, what's, what the Tibetans have brought in the, in the West lately which is they themselves would not consider that they created this. They, they are preserving the great ancient culture of India, which was the great mother culture of Eurasia, actually, in this latest history, for sure. It was the, I would like to say it was the California of Eurasia in the ancient times, and was just way ahead of everybody. And, uh, and they, and, uh, and what they, they, des they, they developed extraordinary methodologies of going into the unconscious and redesigning and creating archetypes, you know, whole mandala thing and all of that. But that's all on the basis of this no eye, no ear, no nose, in other words. You can't, you, because you don't have the power of imagination to make those creative, uh, to, to, to successfully do that creativity unless you have sort of freed your imagination completely from being imprisoned in all routinized conceptualities, which, you, which, which is what you melt, you melt those by vo voidness, emptiness. Emptiness is the mother, that, the mother of free, that freedom. You know, the, the contemplate, it's the medicine of that freedom. But not if emptiness is thought of as the absolute. The emptiness of emptiness, it's itself empty, in other words. Emptiness is. So the, that's the program. The details of that I cover very much in my introduction to the book, of the, the, my version of the Book of the Dead. There are some much more heavy tomes that have been translated here and there about this kind of thing. Tantra is like that. That same Lama who was worried about Miss Piggy, he once answered somebody. Somebody said, oh, Rinpoche, what is Tantra? You know, he passed away that one, but he was particularly nice. And uh, he said, and I'd never heard anyone say that before then. He said, well, you know, the job of wisdom and of uh, Prajnaparamita is to destroy the world of suffering, to really destroy it, to just eliminate it and melt into the luminosity. But once having done that, the luminosity is not, is not you know, just out somewhere outside of the world. It is the nature, inner nature of the world. And then there are those who are not enjoying it. You immediately become aware when you merge with it. And so then rebuilding a world based on wisdom is then the job of Tantra, the methodology of rebuilding the world for the benefit of to, to embrace, to enfold with maximum effectiveness those who are suffering and provide the medicine for them. That's what its job is. So there, there's, no, there's no final... No final Emptiness does not destroy the world. It destroys the ignorance. And then the world is there to be shaped. To be, and, and what you do when you realize emptiness is you take responsibility for reshaping it at, to whatever degree you can. And the highest ability to reshape is what a Buddha has because you're sort of present everywhere in it. You're sort of merged with your materials, something like that. 
Okay? So that's, that's kind of what we want to do. And then the bodhisattva, if the bodhisattva gets the imagination, if something triggers in a bodhisattva's imagination that, oh, one could be like that, it makes sense. Given infinite opportunity, given infinite past that beings have already become like that and left methodologies of how to do it, given the fact that might as well try something stuck here infinitely and it's boring to be infinitely suffering, then I'll, I want to be that. So then that becomes the bodhisattva vow. You know, one then becomes the, decides, I'm going to be a bodhisattva. I'm going to live for the bliss of all beings. And that's a motivation that that makes the same meditation you could do where you're just trying to attain your own nirvana. The same thing becomes a bodhisattva practice when your motivation is you're, you're simul you are doing that in the acknowledgement, although you don't yet viscerally experience it, of your complete connectedness to everybody else. So you're doing it in everyone else as well as in yourself. That's the bodhisattva thing. And they say that's like a glorious sunrise. That's like, that's, that's a Buddhist version of being born again, something like that. Because it's like turning your heart inside out. You're going to really focus, you're going to be altruist. Because, because then that's the only, the only hope in an infinite setting Right? There's two ways of being in an infinite entanglement with infinite numbers of beings. Everyone can be just for themselves and battling it out with everyone else endlessly. It's hell. Right? Or everyone can be in love with everybody else, only wanting everybody else to be happy. And if the price of that is, well, in one way, you're included in everyone yourself. So, you know, but mainly in outlook, Forget about yourself. Let them all be happy. If each one is doing that, then you get, instead of one person worrying about yourself, you have everybody else worrying about you. That's called a Buddha land. Sometimes I equate a Buddha land with John Belushi food fight universe. <laughs> <laughs> because in the selfish land, I got my dessert over here, my shumuso chocolate, you know. Don't look at it, you know. I've just got mine, you know. I, I don't want to share it over at Buddhist retreat. Well, maybe I should, but no, no, I want it. That's one. And then Food Fight University. Oh, everyone here, here's to have some dessert. And then you give away your dessert, and then you get mushed with everybody else's thing, and then you throw it back, you know. So it's a food fight. It's a dessert fight. Very, very unhealthy when you get sugar into it. It would all be diabetic. But uh, so that, that's, uh, and that's, a pos that's possible. In other words, one has to first imagine that that's possible. And in the, ho the whole terrible thing, like I've been in many Zen centers, and they go like, beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. Then you say, are you going to have a future life? Oh, no, no. I'm a modern scientific person. I read the inquiring mind. I'm a, I love West Nisker, you know, not me, no way, that's an old-fashioned thing, some old-fashioned, I don't know. Even maybe oh, Steve Bachelor says maybe Buddha didn't even believe it in himself. Give me a break. Like, what the, how can anybody be Buddha without infinite evolutionary canvas on which to draw such, a, or create a Buddha world, a Buddha verse, as I call it, Buddha land? How is that possible in one life? No way. So they're just mouthing something that they, when they say it, they know they can't do it. So then they're actually weakening their sense of self-confidence of their resolves and determination. You know? So that's why the first step is to create the, is to meditate on the precious jewel of a human life endowed with liberty and opportunity. To realize how great each one of us is with an amazing opportunity, and you bootstrap yourself to it when you were a tiger, lion, crocodile, you know. You were the crocodile who let, like, uh, somebody go, you know. And then you got a worse jaw later. You're not so long. <laughs> Although even crocodile, I used to rag on crocodiles. We're going to stop now. I used to rag on crocodiles, and then I saw one movie about an Indian alligator or crocodile in a river somewhere. And that mother crocodile buried all those eggs in, this, in some sand in a corner of the riverbank. And then she stood guard so the male crocodiles wouldn't come eat them. It's, apparently, they're not cool, too. 
And then when they hatch and sort of wriggling out, and then birds come and predators and different things, she goes over there with this very clumsy, huge jaw, like a kind of spatula with, 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 with big teeth. And she picks them up like this and takes them some, she gets them in the water safely with this sort of shovel, shovel jaw that she has, you know, because, you know, claws can't do anything. Poor thing, you know. What, I mean, she still has that maternal thing, even though it's an egg that is not, was not in her body directly. You know? So I, 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 don't, I apologize to Mother Rockadal. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, the idea of the nature, you know, I completely freaked out when I saw that French movie about the penguins. Did you ever see that? <laughs> and then I, for, for weeks, I went around with my toes all cramped like this. It's the most ridiculous thing. How come the male doesn't have a pouch? What's the matter with them? Remember, she, the female has to take the thing and put it on the male's feet. And if it touches the ice in the winter, that egg, it's, or what the embryo, it's just done instantly frozen. And then the female has to go miles away and go and catch a, catch a what do they eat, seals, fish. They eat some fish, and then they come back sliding on their belly, and then the male gives it back from toe to toe. And the flipper, there's no hand, there's no basket, there's nothing. What a nightmare. My toes were really bothering me. 